Welcome back to The Morning Brew. I'm Nasli Lagor. If you're just joining us, earlier in the program, we spoke with Nafisa Mohammed, explaining to us why she resigned from the People's National Movement. And I asked her, why now? She said, why not now? And right now, we have been speaking with the Minister of National Security and the Member of Parliament for Port of Spain North, the St. Anne's West, Stuart Young. And right before we went to that break, he told us that members of the opposition are profiting from human trafficking. Minister, is, it, is, there an, is there an obsession with the opposition? We're always hearing these allegations of what the opposition is involved in, but somehow those allegations don't ever seem to turn to evidence where people are convicted, people are charged for what you are proposing they're doing. Why is all right, that? First of, all, I, first of all, there are suggestions and allegations. I think everybody saw it, especially around nomination day. Exactly that 24-hour period before nomination day, I saw things start to surface with allegations about the opposition having to change certain persons and not take them up for nomination because of allegations of exactly that being involved in human trafficking. That is what I was referring to. I agree with you very often they are, and as a minister, and I'm, I'm saying this aside to that last conversation we just had, you receive as Minister of National Security reports, you receive intelligence reports. I think we now understand how intelligence has to be converted to evidence. Evidence then has to be cross a certain threshold for charges to be made. Actually, I never say anything, and I say this without fear of contradiction. I have never stated anything in public office, and especially in the portfolio of Minister of National Security, that I don't have things to back it up on that were provided to me by the Trinidad and Tobago Police Service or Intelligence Services. So I put that on the record very, very clearly. But again, and yes, the wheels of justice take too long. If you have things to back it up, why is it that those things aren't turning into evidence? That, so that's that a the good question. population, the population can say, okay, the People's National Movement on the platform is accusing the opposition United National Congress of these things, and we can see action happening. Where is the disconnect? Agreed. Agreed completely. So I get, as the Minister of National Security, an intelligence report in writing, in black and white, that a member of parliament is meeting at the Hyatt with persons who are persons of interest in the criminal world, some of whom have criminal charges. And he went to the Hyatt to pay a bar bill for them. That is a fact. So that arrives to me as the Minister of National Security. What am I supposed to do with it? Obviously, it concerns me. It concerns me as a citizen. Why would a sitting member of parliament leave the parliament when we were down at the waterfront on a Friday afternoon when there's a disruption taking place in the Hyatt with criminals, persons who have criminal records and have engaged in criminal activity to go and pay their bar bill. So they could create all of the things and say, well, I was in charge and I am not this, I, am. I received that in black and white. So of course it concerns me. And then I ask the police service, I say, okay, well, you all have provided this. I assume you all are going to investigate it and action it. And that's where it stops. I am not going to be telling the police, go and investigate short young you know, you've told me, no, you've provided me with the information. I expect and I know that our police service is a responsible police service, and they will now go the next step to do what needs to be done. Okay, Minister, one of the issues that has been plaguing the population, everybody's been talking about it, are TNT nationals who are stuck outside of Trinidad and Tobago due to the coronavirus pandemic. Now, you've been tasked with the responsibility of returning the nationals to their rightful place to Trinidad and Tobago. But there are questions as to how you choose who gets exemption, when they get exemption, and why you're giving them exemption. I am asking you, how do you determine if you have 200 people to return from country X, how do you determine who of those 200 people are going to be exempt to give them that exemption to return to Trinidad and Tobago? Uh, Natalie, I am sitting here and I can actually show you if you're seeing. This is the, the latest folder, not of all of the jurisdictions, of the thousands of names that I'm currently looking at. There is no secret to the criteria, right? So I'm seeing this suggestion that you had to go to court to get the criteria, etc. From day one, 
there's been a very principled position. Let us start with this. And thank you for the opportunity to, to, to state it. And it has already been put out in the public domain because there was a, a, a request and the permanent secretary has put out what is the criteria as far as we can go because I understand at the end of the day is people's personal information. These sheets of paper, these hundreds of sheets of paper, of spreadsheet, contain persons' personal information, why it is that they say they should be prioritized in coming home. Let's start. First of all, Trinidad, as a government, we took a decision to protect all of our population here in Trinidad and close our borders. The second thing is when we're granting exemptions, you're always balancing the numbers. So how many, because we've taken a further decision that every national coming back has to go into quarantine. State quarantine initially, and now we have a second category of state supervised quarantine where you can pay in certain institutions. Those facilities to rush through it as quickly as I can have to be manned by medical personnel who have to monitor. And then, so, so there's that balancing exercise limited. Trinidad is very fortunate that we have a parallel healthcare system to deal with COVID that has not affected the running of our daily healthcare system. So persons still on a daily basis can go into the hospitals, the health centers and get attention because we built out a separate COVID parallel system. You can't let those numbers go out of flux and pull persons to the deterioration of your normal healthcare system. So you're dealing with a limited number of ability and capacity to quarantine people. That is our decision. Everyone qu coming back will be quarantined. So you're dealing with a limited number of spaces there. You're then also balancing that with, as we are looking at right now, if cases suddenly spike and increase and they're in the parallel healthcare system, you don't want it to be overrun. So whatever numbers we always have in quarantine, we're balancing with a worst case that suppose now there's an outbreak, a local outbreak, and amongst those who have come back, we must be able to contain them in our parallel healthcare system. So that's the first point. Understand it's a limited number. Then what we got to is you look, we were looking at jurisdictions and bringing back persons from jurisdictions at points in time in a managed process. All nationals will get back, but it has to be managed. That is what has helped us a lot so far. Again, I was looking last night at at Jamaica and Prime Minister Holland is standing up in the parliament and saying, listen, persons that we allow to come back and go home and self-quarantine are not doing it. And he's referring to we senior posts on social media. So we know that we have to quarantine people. Then when you start to look at the list now, Natalie, I broke it up. Persons who are elderly, because we have different categories of people. So there may be people who went away for a week or two weeks in March and got stuck outside. You would have only gone for two weeks in your mind. Now you're stuck outside for months. That is different to what we're seeing now, persons who chose to make their life in foreign countries and are domiciled and resident in foreign countries. And maybe for one reason or another, they may have lost their jobs, there may be difficulties there, or they just think, I don't want to be here anymore, I want to go home to Trinidad. They are now applying. So how do you prioritize that? So we're looking at the elderly, the sick, then we look at persons who have young children. We have quite a few people who went abroad and ended up having their babies abroad. So a lot of newborn babies and, and mothers who are, who are suffering and want to come home. And then you look at those with young children. Then you have another category of the students. Now the students would have only started coming up in the latter part as they finish their courses, etc. So do these students take priority over those who were there for longer? So consistently what we look at is the date of initial application for exemption. And then you look at the extenuating circumstances as well. Of, of persons. So it is a constant balancing. It is not an easy thing. It is certainly not a task I wish on anybody. But I mean, those are the criteria that we're looking at and that we're applying. And then, of course, you have limited space, as I say. So even when you're having a plane repatriate, so I can say now, right now I'm looking at the full set of repatriation flights from the United States. So we're going to use a CAL plane in the next week to take students and other persons up to the United States who want to go, and we're going to bring back our first plane load. Of persons. Yesterday, I was working out with the Ministry of Health, a specified designated facility to put those persons who return from the US there, and then you continue that. And I'll tell you, I expect us to have positive cases in there because the United States right now is ground zero. That is the biggest explosion of population of positive cases. So these are the criteria that are being used. So you look at the age of the person, how long the person has been out there the capacity when of the health system for, when for, they for, put in correct. their applications correct but let me if, ask if you they this. Have young children if you have if you have 50 students in jamaica 
and all 50 of them applied for exemption. How do you determine of that 50 students from that one jurisdiction who comes home first? That actually, if, if we were turning to Jamaica again, because remember, we did a repatriation of our UE students at Jamaica. And I'll tell you, some chose not to come home because they had practicals going on, they had exams, they wanted to stay on for internship, etc. And now they're, 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 they would like to come home. But of course, the priority has now turned, well, you have other jurisdictions. If you had 50, Natalie, a plane could hold that, that 50 and bring them back. So we would have granted exemptions to all. So like the students in Cuba, for example, granted exemptions to all. Not everyone came back on a flight. With Grenada the other day, I granted exemptions to 76 persons to come back from Grenada. When the plane arrived, it only arrived with 54. So you, you go through those types of things. The difficulty really is, like for example, the United States, where you have over 1,100 applications currently, and an application could contain a family of five, or can, could contain a group of 10. So, so it's exponentially multiplied how when you only have a plane that can hold 120 persons to bring them back that that is where the difficulty becomes and that is what we're trying to push through